we've got a great star today. His name is Richard Benjamin. You know, you may know Richard from a lot of movies over the years, and also he was a director too for many of the movies. Welcome to our show, Richard. Thank you, John. Nice to be here. Well, first question: How did you get into acting? <laughs> Uh, I guess I always wanted to do it. I did it in uh, grade school in New York and public school. And uh, I think the first thing I ever did, I played in the sixth grade, I played um, Scrooge in The Christmas Carol uh, in my public school there. Um, it took me about half a year to learn the part because I had no idea really what I was saying. Um, and I don't know if you remember, but in Scrooge, uh, Dickens has him say, bah humbug. Yeah. And that's what I said as my as a little sixth grader. And then I got my first review, my first critique, my first negative review from the principal of the school uh -huh. who said to me, uh, Richard, I don't think it's bah humbug. I think it's bah humbug. <laughs> so I didn't quite get that right. Although I think he was wrong to tell you the truth. <laughs> well, indeed. Uh, and then you went all the way uh, from that, all the way to uh, great stardom. I mean, from being uh, a Golden Globe winner in Sunshine Boys. How about that? I mean, could you tell us a little about that? Uh, that was a great experience because of uh, Walter Matthau and George Burns, who were just great people and became real good friends. Walter and I did another movie together, House Calls, and uh, Walter and my wife Paula and myself, we uh, and his wife Carol, we all got to be really good friends. So that was a wonderful experience. Um, great script by Neil Simon. And getting to work with George Burns was just a treat. And, and you also did uh, Love at First Bite with George Hamilton. Right. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, written by Bob Kaufman, who was a wild man. And um, the original title of that, he sent me a script called Dracula Sucks Again. And I said, I'm not going to be in any movie yeah. called Dracula Sucks Again. It sounded like a, some kind of pornographic something or other. And then he said to me, well, how about Love at First Bite? And I said, how does one person no come up with those two titles one horrible title and then one great title he said well will you do it if i call it love at first bite and i said yeah we'll do it so we had a great time and george was wonderful to work with and uh george had done uh, my wife's first picture um, um where the boys are so uh it was great working with him well, then there's also, uh, bring up a lot of the movies and shows, uh, Westworld. What was uh, that like to work uh, on Westworld? That's the original Westworld. Because I know that, you know, that came out a couple of years ago on HBO, uh, the uh, updated version. But the original one, you and Yul Brenner. Uh, yeah, yeah. Another wonderful experience working with Yul. Um, Yul uh, was just a great man. Um, and again, we became friends. Uh, so that's one of the great things about movies. Uh, you get to be with people you'd never in a million years get to meet, let alone, you know, get to be friends with. And um, he was wonderful to work with, just a great guy. Well, then you basically went from uh, acting, and you, which you did a lot of acting, well, I mean, and uh, then you, what, how did you go from transitioning from acting into directing? How did that come about? Um, well, I always wanted to do it. Um, and uh, we had a wonderful agent here, Phil Gersh, who was basically a director's agent. Uh, he was Robert Wise's agent, Arthur Hiller. Um, uh, Mark Robeson, uh, he was basically a director's agent. And years and years before uh, I met him, because uh, he was Paula's agent, and um, I talked to him about directing. And then after a long time, uh, we came back out here and I, we got together with Phil. And he said, well, whatever happened to that directing thing? I said, yeah, I want to do that. And he said, well, let me work on that. I mean... It seems impossible because if you're an actor, you can go in and, you know, audition for something and maybe 10 minutes later you 
get the part, but all you need to do is show up, you know, with a couple of pages of script in your hand. Uh, but directing, how? who's going to let you do that? I mean, you there's a, a budget, there's a uh, over, you know, uh, 180 people uh, on a crew, and uh, why should anyone let you do that? Um, so, but Phil and his son uh, David uh, got me um, a pilot to direct, a pilot of Where's Papa, the movie Where's Papa was made into a TV pilot. So I did that. So there was some, you know, film on what I could do. And then um, I got sent the script through uh, David Gersh. Uh, Paul and I were in New York doing something, and it was my favorite year. And the, uh, they said, well, they want to meet you and talk to you about this. So we came back here, had a meeting with Mel Brooks and Michael Gruskoff, who produced it. And uh, we all hit it off. And they said, OK, well, you direct it. Because the thing is that I grew up in New York and I worked at NBC. I was a page at NBC and a guide. And I knew that whole, you know, area, you know, like the back of my hand. And also the, the your show of shows with Sid Caesar was something that my friends and I at school loved. And we would do all the skits afterwards and stuff like that. So I knew that whole territory really well. Um, and so uh, they said, OK, uh, direct it. So, I mean, again, there's so much luck in this business. I mean, you've got to be ready, but, you know, it's a, it's 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 luck. There's a lot of luck involved. You've been a very lucky gentleman, I can tell you. Uh, I have. I mean, from all the shows and everything. And going speaking of the shows, uh, how about Quark? I know uh, we brought that up when I gave you a call uh, here a while back. And uh, even though you may not think there's fans out there, let me tell you, I've got several folks that I know, and uh, it's a got a cult following. And I mean, it didn't last long. I mean, on NBC. But you, can you tell us anything about? The, what it was like to just, I mean, to be on a, a weekly series beyond. Well, you know, it, that's a perfect example of something when um, anybody, <laughs> I feel very, uh, uh, you know, close to people who really like Quark because Quark is such a favorite of mine. And that came about because there's a handful of people that if you, um, if they want, if they have something, and they, if, if it's Buck Henry or Lane May or Neil Simon and M Mel Brooks and maybe a few others, Carl Reiner, people like that who want to work with you, I immediately say yes. I don't even care what it is, um, and I immediately say yes. And then when I, I got a call about Quark, and it was Buck. Um, whose whole thrust in his whole career is to do something original, uh, I said, I, I got to do this. And they said, well, you know, you've been in movies and stuff. We don't think you, we can afford you. And I said, let's not worry about that. Uh, let, let's, I want to do this because it was Buck Henry. Um, and it was so unusual and, and so smart, but... It, it it when it went on NBC, they didn't quite know what it was. They they said, "Is should this be on Saturday morning for children? Uh, what is this?" Um, so we only had eight of them, and it was starting, you know, to get an audience. In fact, we got fan mail from nuclear physicists because some of the stuff in there was actually based on real science, um, and also the you know the kind of satire of having a garbage man in space and uh, all of that and these characters were just creations of bucks you know gene gene uh who you know even today would be quite an interesting character of somebody who was a male one minute and a female the next minute um uh, you know and the fact that buck called him gene gene i mean about genes and then we had uh, Otto Palindrome. Uh, Otto is a palindrome, O-T-T-O. And then there was a character called The Head, who was only a head. 
Uh, and then we had the the twins, the Barnstable twins. One of them was real and the other was a clone. I mean, these are pretty modern things even today. Um, so when people like that show, I'm, I'm happy about it. It sounds like it could be a possibility of a remake here in the modern day. You ever thought about that? I mean, maybe give it a second try? I'm ready. I'm, I'm here. I'm ready. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you've got if you got Picard. I mean, with Patrick Stewart. Yeah. I mean, why not? Yeah, yeah. Why not have Quark yeah. in the modern day? I mean, uh, and and, yeah. and and Buck Henry. I mean, from uh, you know, obviously Get Smart. I mean, it was just yeah. you know, like Get Smart at first got then folks didn't get it at first, but then it lasted for many years. I guess. Yeah. You, given you time, gotta, you, they should if they had left it on. I I think it would have you know, it would have uh, really taken off. Yeah. So you also did uh, a series back in the 60s, He and She. Uh, any uh, stories about that? With your wife, Paula Prentice. With my um, beautiful wife, Paula. Yeah, that, well, that was um, CBS wanted to do a show with Paula. Um, and they didn't know anything about me or anything. Um, and she said, well, I'll only do this if uh, you do it with my husband. And they said, well, who is he? And then... It turned out that Leonard Stern and his wife, Gloria Stern, Gloria had seen me in a production in Chicago of Barefoot in the Park, which I toured with with Myrna Loy, which was another wonderful experience. But she had seen me and she said to Leonard, "You should." before they even wanted to do the show, there's an actor, Richard Benjamin, he would be something, you, a guy you would like and all that. So... And I did, we did Barefoot in the Park out here also with Myrna. Um, and Leonard said uh, to CBS, well, Paula will do the show, but she wants to do it with um, her husband. And CBS said, well, is he an actor? Um, so <laughs> Leonard said, we hope so. Um, that's how that happened. All right, and uh, well, now speaking of you and Paula, sixty over sixty years of marriage. Any uh, advice for the folks out there? How do you keep <laughs> happy for sixty you might, years? You have to marry Paula. <laughs> that's that's the key. That's the key to it. Um, so there you talk again. You talk about luck. I mean, you can't make these things up. Um, I was at Northwestern University. Um, in the theater department, and Paula transferred there from Randolph-Macon Women's College. And the minute I laid eyes on her, I thought, oh boy, you know. Um, and then we got together. I directed her in a play, and we had nice late-night rehearsals, and, which led to other things. And um, after a little while, our acting teacher, Alvina Krauss, the brilliant acting teacher there, said that somebody was coming from MGM just to look at talent around the country. This man had toured all over uh, the United States just looking at kid, people in colleges and things to see if there was somebody that might interest, you know, people at MGM. Um, and he was coming there, and if we anybody wanted to audition, uh, they could do that. So Paul, I convinced Paula, at first she didn't want to do it, to audition. She and I did a scene for him in February in the middle of a blizzard. Uh, and uh, he, I could see he was real interested in her. And then in June of that year, as we were graduating, uh, she got a call and said they would like her to come out to California to do a screen test. So... She did. Uh, she called me and said, I passed the test. It sounded like it was an SAT or something, but I passed it. And then she was under contract to MGM. So, you know, you can't make that up. You, you, you can't, you know, figure that out that you're going to actually control that and make that happen. Um, it's, it's, you got to be in the right place at the right time, but um there's luck and like you said you're very lucky i mean in a career and in life and uh i know of a story that you might want to recap folks about uh, many years ago you told johnny carson uh, again speaking of your marriage uh, uh that you hang around in the kitchen after uh, certain dishes are washed do you still do that after 40 or 50 years after being on the carson show explaining that story 
I'm sorry to say I still do. Uh, <laughs> I should be put away somewhere. But, well, we... um, <laughs> you know, so I did say, say tell that story uh, on, the, on the Carson show. And <laughs> maybe you could just recap the folks and tell them what. Well, what I what I did was that when Paula loads the dishwasher, it I I. It has to be loaded in my. This sounds completely crazy. And, oh no! Oh um, no, no! I think it's one of the funniest stories I've ever heard. <laughs> so when she goes to bed earlier, I reload the dishwasher because I don't like it the way it is. These things, the dishes must not touch each other. Uh -huh. Silverware has to be separated, and the glasses go on the top shelf. And I told all of that. And then I think Johnny said, uh, is Paula going to be all right with this? I said, oh, yeah, she's, yeah, it'll be fine. Um, and the next thing I know, uh, the next day, we recorded the show. She's not seen it. Um, and so I'm out shopping. I'm in a supermarket or somewhere, and someone says, is your marriage still okay? <laughs> and I said, why? Well, has Paula seen that show? And I said, uh, no. And everywhere I went, they said, are you okay? Uh, is Paula still with you? I said, what are they talking about? Mm -hmm. And then I realized that it didn't reflect so well on Paula. So, but then I showed it to Paula and she thought it was hysterical. So. All righty, and uh, you know, th there you go again. Uh, a great marriage and happiness and everything, and uh, and happiness with the career. And uh, where are you going? But I, I wanted to say, you know, that that's that thing. You get on a show like that, uh -huh. and I did that show like I don't know. Someone told me I did it thirty-three times. Okay. That you're after laughs. That show is not an interview show. That's a comedy show. Basically, yes. And so, and especially with him, who was brilliant um and if he's laughing along you just keep going um and and you're getting him going and getting the audience going so you're just after laughs um sometimes you may take down a few people while you're doing that but being funny uh is the job well, and nothing and nothing beats funny. Well, I think you being uh, funny and uh, Johnny being funny uh, made for a great classic television. Uh, before we go, uh, let me just ask you here in the next couple of minutes uh, still, yeah. uh, what's your future look like? I know you, do you still have any plans for any, uh, I know you did You People just recently on uh, Netflix. Uh, do you have any other plans uh, here in the near future? I did a, I did a movie uh, not long ago called Divorced Dads in New York. Uh -huh. uh, and they're, they're still working on the cutting of that. So um, I'm not sure when that'll come out. Um, but my future is just to continue to be here. Uh, I'm happy with that. Oh, well, keep you around as long as George Burns, I guess. You know, you can be, I'll give you 100. And you're only 39 now, right? That's right. I'm 39, as we said, just like Jack Benny. That's just like Jack you know, Benny. Yeah, and, and George say, said... Uh, be, just as he became, uh, he said, um, I can't quit, I'm booked. <laughs> um, and he was booked in Vegas at 100. Um, and um, those guys, Jack Benny and George Burns and the character Walter played, you know, you talk about funny. And we knew Milton Berle, who was always funny, Red Buttons. Those guys just were ready to work. Um, and they would they would go and Bob Hope and they they only wanted to work. They were on stage more than they were off stage, uh, playing vaudeville and all of that. Um, and the main thing it was that they were funny. Well, Richard, it has been a pleasure to have you on my show here, and uh, you are a very lucky man again in uh, career and in life. And it's hopefully many many more years of luck to you.